All right, hello and welcome to Real Talk Office Hours Hunting for Silver Linings for this Wednesday, July 8, 2020. Hosted today by Corey Hart, your mirrors truly. We have George Katsanos. We're both from Startup Grind Grand Rapids over in Michigan, the U.S. Then we have a very special guest today. It's uh, Kate of Startup Grind St. Petersburg. Overall brought to you by Startup Grind, the world's largest startup community. We have 600 plus chapters in over 125 countries, and we operate with a mission to educate, inspire, and connect. This pandemic, it has been and will continue to be a great global leveler. Now, as entrepreneurs, we do our very best for our businesses, teams, and families, and we need to be informed, rational, analytical, and rigorous in our thinking. We should also learn to control our biases as they emerge in various circumstances. We invite you to join us live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as we track these uh, the, as we track the intersection of these facts, biases, and action through our review of global financial markets, alongside check-ins with Real and Real Talk with Startup Grind chapter directors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem stakeholders from around the world. We do this because no one has a crystal ball, but if we keep our eyes and ears open and pay attention, we may be able to see around the bend and with some luck spot silver linings that are around every cloud. Now, if you miss the lives of live events, you can always catch the recordings at startupgrind.com slash grand dash rapids, where you can also download the reading notes from the shows. Now, before I uh, introduce George for um, his uh, market update, we have a little bit of housekeeping. The comments made and views expressed by all participants in this podcast are not intended to invite or incite individuals, entrepreneurs, or investors to buy or sell financial assets, real assets, commodities, futures, or and or options. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform, not to trade or to invest. If you feel compelled to trade and or invest, please call your broker. Now remember, risk is everywhere, even when you think that you're not taking a risk. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce George Katsanos to get us started with the global financial market update. George, all yours. And you're muted, I think. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Talk. As you see, the dollar is trading on the upper range against the euro. In the middle of the crisis, we saw the dollar euro pair trade 106, 107. Um, the high was 115. Um, as we have always mentioned, the dollar euro pair, um, as indeed um, the other pairs that we're looking at, um, give us information about the um, global markets. And in particular, they give us information about the um, risk on risk of type of um, um, changes. In other words, the stronger the dollar, the more um, investors are flogging back into the US due to fear, due to uncertainty, due to safe haven considerations. On the other hand, when we look the dollar weaken, as we have seen it weaken over the last few trading sessions against the major crosses like the Euro, um, the yen, sterling, uh, and so on and so forth, what we're beginning to see is um, risk on. In other words, investors are going back into local currencies and their view is first and foremost felt in currencies. The bond market, however, is telling us a different story. As you can see, the uh, fixed income market, the 10 year in particular, is remaining unchanged throughout Asia Pacific throughout Europe and indeed here in the US. Um, Japan at 0%, Australia 0.86, Hong Kong 0.3, Singapore 0.86, South Korea 1.37, and India well under 6%. Not significant changes, and that tells us that the bond market is still concerned about safety, about the medium term developments due to the coronavirus. In Europe, the same picture, um, the market remain well, uh, remains well bid at the 10 year level. Uh, Greece um, is flirting with 1% yields, unheard of, unseen. Italy, 118. These are major changes suggesting that investors 
in Europe remain conscious, very conscious indeed. And the same picture we have here in the US. On the commodity front, what we're beginning to see is um, uh, changes that have to do with um, with expectations. In other words, um, West Texas Intermediate is trading at the moment um, at, um, let me put it up on the screen for you. It is trading at uh, $40 and change. Um, we are of course uh, much higher than this time last year where we were trading at about $60. Um, you see the rapid recovery uh, over the last uh, couple of months in the price of crude. Clearly, the supply considerations and concerns that we've had uh, in late spring, early summer have abated and the market remains well bid. Um, natural gas, on the other hand, um, is um, natural gas uh, is um, trading at 184, where in the middle of the summer, air conditioning uh, is um, being used continuously. So I would expect that uh, natural gas will remain well supported here. When we look um, at uh, the gold picture though, we are at new highs. Um, we mentioned that late last week and uh, the week before that, the market is concerned. We hit a high of 1827 today. Um, at the moment we're trading at 1825. The market is concerned about uh, again, inflation, potential for inflation, and the debasement of currencies. The silver lining, as far as commodities are concerned, and what the commodity market is telling us, comes from copper. Copper is an industrial metal, and we've seen uh, how it has traded as low as $1.9 uh, dollars per pound. It is now trading at $2.82 near the previous year's high of 2.9. Industrial activity in China and in Southeast Asia is picking up and that is reflected in the price of copper. In fact, the rally that we've seen over the last few days in Asia is uh, reflected of this market. It explains the um, demand for industrial goods. Looking into the grains, I'm starting now with uh, corn. You have seen that uh, corn hit a low of about uh, $301 uh, per pound per bushel back in um, the middle of the crisis. Uh, it is trading at 351. The big question is whether the um, relations with China will improve and whether the Chinese will start importing more um, corn. The soybean market is very similar. We're trading in the middle of the range of the previous high, which was 961. The previous low was 808. So we will see which way the market goes. Um, what is, however, important for all grains to bear in mind is that the conditions are very supportive of a large crop. Whether we're talking about wheat, soybeans, or um, corn, what we see is the crop is ample the weather conditions are wet enough uh, for the uh, products to grow sufficiently. And what we expect is that the supply will push or rather remain um, a factor in um, pushing pr prices of the grains at a lower level. Having said that, um, the equity market is incredibly optimistic. Um, Starting from Southeast Asia, where the picture today has been mixed, we have seen um, green across the board uh, coming from China because of, of production, because of growth. Um, we're seeing um, a um, Southeast Asian picture remaining relatively positive and benign due to, of course, uh, the liquidity, uh, the ample liquidity in the financial markets. And this has been reflected to some extent in Europe. Although in Europe, the picture is mixed, I think uh, Europe will remain um, under duress unless and until the current president of the European Union, which is Germany, 
pushes effectively and efficiently towards some form of allocating the funds that have been promised for um, stimulus. Here in the US, our markets are up at three quarters of a percent across the board, with the exception of NASDAQ, which is again up 1.2%. The markets expect more support from the government, they expect more stimulus money, and therefore the rally continues. Back to you, Corey. Great, thank you so much, George. Um, there is, um, there's a lot of attention on, pay, uh, on looking at the recovery as it has been in, in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia is particularly, and comparing that to what we can try to expect out of Europe and the US. Uh, with, the, with the reading and everything that you're paying attention, would you be able to maybe um, talk a little bit about that and maybe what entrepreneurs can uh, read into some of these uh, somewhat optimistic Yes, um, as we mention regularly in our um, uh, review of the financial markets, uh, Corey, both entrepreneurs and investors are well advised not only to look into one specific area of the market, i.e. equities, but to look across the board because different parts of the market will tell us uh, different aspects of the story. For instance, the grains are telling us about geopolitical rivalry when it comes to industrial metals like copper, the story is of recovery and growth. Um, when we talk, of, uh, when we look into um, energies, we see that um, our oil and gas uh, supply considerations have abated. When we look at gold, we see that the community is concerned about debasing the currencies, about uh, weakening um, the monetary control. And uh, at this time of the COVID crisis, the market is concerned that we may see inflation uh, down the road. As uh, Jeremy Siegel mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago in one of his podcasts uh, with um, a Masters in Business. So uh, net net, the bond market is the one that is in my mind um, closer to the truth. The bond market is very cautious, given the fact that we have so much money allocated by the Federal Reserve in purchasing every type of asset class you can imagine, it is surprising that the market is still, in the US at least, at 0.6, 0.7% for the 10 year yield. Um, this concern is what I always mention to our entrepreneurs and investors alike. Please be careful. The next normal, as many of our interviewees have indicated, is going to be disruptive. We're not even halfway there yet. And more important than that, we're hearing from corners of the financial edifice that the banking system is beginning to see non-performing loan portfolios in commercial lending, in industrial lending, and also some of the consumer uh, lending. So against this background, we need to be cautious. That doesn't mean we need to be disheartened. On the contrary, we as entrepreneurs and we as investors need to be very cautious about where we put our money. We need to be paying attention to our cash flow and to the opportunities of sustaining the business we're in. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you for that update. Looking forward to, uh, to Fridays as we close out this, uh, this exciting week with a lot of news coming. And now I'd love to move to our portion where we talk with uh, our Startup Grind chapter director. We have Kate over from St. Petersburg, Russia, not Florida, but Russia. And um, so Kate, thanks so much for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I, I'm just happy to be here with you and uh, share some insights from my side. Yeah, and one, one of the main reasons why we do this, Kate, is because um, while we see globally and locally that our supply chains are shrinking um, within our regions in some sectors and some segments um, mm -hmm. due to COVID, um, this, this whole idea of being able to connect remotely uh, for a large part of the workforce, not everybody, uh, but it has led to the expansion of, the, um, uh, of globalization of ideas and yep. uh, globalization of op opportunity because of that and also for investment. And when it comes to uh, stuff like what we do for startups, it's a real advantage. Um, what George had on his screen before he got started was uh, uh, Bloomberg News. And there was even a, mm -hmm. there was an article on there that had said, um, cities are no longer 
um, the key to, uh, to personal growth or career growth, right? Uh, yeah, and then, sure. And how, how fast does that happen? It's, yeah, right there, escalators of opportunity. Um, so it's people like you, it's people like George, myself, and sort of Prime that are, are now these escalators of opportunity, I think. Um, yeah. So I uh, would love to hear a little bit about you personally. Um, like who, who are you, why are you? And uh, uh, you, uh, I see like you have experience being like working with tech stars. Uh, the organization that you're currently with is really focused um, you know, in the digital space. Um, and then also um, maybe tell us how you ended up with Startup Grind. Yeah, sure. Uh, I studied as a journalist and after, um, after that, I start uh, my career as event manager and organizer of rock concerts and some parties, something like that. And after that, I moved into uh, in St. Petersburg from a city from, in Ural, it's in the middle of Russia. And uh, in St. Petersburg, I started uh, work with marketing agencies and uh, at one moment, I started my own agency, which was focused on public relations, content marketing, and event management. We was uh, the first representative of Nordic Business Forum. Maybe you know this big event in Finland. It's like a huge event for pre-Baltics and Nordics uh, as well. And uh, we represent uh, this company in Russia and uh, attract uh, customers, support them, and so on. And uh, in 2000. 15, I started, um, curated a community of digital companies uh, named Special. It's my current uh, full-time job and uh, I'm coordinating projects uh, which includes conferences, uh, online events, some collaborative projects between digital companies and agencies in St. Petersburg. It's about um, a union of uh, 50 companies around city and um, uh, we have some strong connection between them and uh, we're trying to build something transparent and friendly some friendly place where founders of digital agencies can support each other and share their expertise and something like uh, i don't know uh, make friendly connections and so on so um it's like about almost five years on this position. And three years ago, I saw um, that in Moscow, um, Kirill Anaprichuk started Startup Grind Moscow chapter and um, they was announced uh, with the values of Startup Grind as well. And I was so excited that someone somewhere <laughs> doing something like I do in special, but in the larger, larger area and globally. And uh, I was so excited that uh, I just uh, immediately uh, sent the application and uh, I was approved um, also fast <laughs> and started to uh, create community around Startup Grind in St. Petersburg. After that, I had experience with uh, Techstar Startup Weekend in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And uh, at the moment, I'm coordinating projects in Russian startup community. It's a company named uh, Startup Russia. We're creating, creating uh, something big and transparent, uh, like special, but also in startup area, but locally. Uh, and uh, um, this company unites local entrepreneurs with global opportunities. So our goal in startup community, create also transparent and friendly place, but for founders, not just digital agencies, but all technical companies, tech companies around Russia. So it's, I think that uh, briefly uh, something about me. <laughs> and uh, I'm just, um, as you can um, remark it, uh, I'm just uh, excited about being involved in some projects which uh, bring some transparent and friendly environment to some areas where people can share their ideas and support each other and uh, uh, trying to do something great together. That's, um, it's, it's really great that you say that. The, the ideas of transparency, openness, um, and collaboration, like this, these, these are the things that we can trade with and, uh, and create opportunity for people, you know, no matter where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I was, uh, 
I was looking a little bit about looking at a little bit about your ecosystem there in St. Petersburg. And, mm-hmm. um, it, uh, the, it's the, the list says, you know, like Moscow, obviously number one, right. Yes. And then, you know, mm-hmm. St. Petersburg and then Kazan. And, yeah. um, and I have, uh, some, some friends and colleagues in Kazan, uh, that mm-hmm. have, you know, worked with Ernst and Young and are now like traveling globally. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I noticed that in St. Petersburg specifically, there are, a bunch of accelerators and uh, incubators for the startup community. Um, yeah, we have several, but not too many. I think mm-hmm. that it's not enough at the moment. What is the so? Talk a little bit more about like that your your very local ecosystem and how easy or difficult it is for someone to enter that startup uh, scene. Do they have to? Can they start in Saint Petersburg and then move, or do they? Do they start in Moscow and then come back home? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that it's pretty simple to be involved in project of these accelerators and incubators. But uh, as I said, I think that there is not too much of these activities and organizations because we have just uh, several governmental um, entities like INGREA or uh, It's More Acceleration pro- Program. It's like... Um, INGRI is governmental program, and uh, uh, it's more, it's a technical university in St. Petersburg, uh, which have a strong program for newbies. So if you experienced enough to know that customer development is, and uh, how to validate idea, you just uh, stock in the... Um, in this place and don't know that, that what to do next. So um, we're creating um, as ourselves some activities uh, which involved acceleration in some kind. Uh, and uh, uh, we do some activities which uh, tr- uh, help entrepreneurs to network and uh, also share their exper- expertise and so on. But um, Actually, acceleration programs in St. Petersburg at the moment, I think that it's not a uh, really huge opportunity for founders. So we have like uh, just several companies who worked on this area. And uh, of course, there, is some, there are some founders uh, which go into these acceleration programs and they have some uh, useful insights from that, but there is not too much. Okay. Well, I guess that, that, that speaks to the need for more community-based help and resources. Yeah. Right? Things like what you're building. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, would you be able to uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the sectors um, that are within the ecosystem there, whether it's uh, like clean energy or medicine? Or- yeah. Uh, we have some, um, some really strong sectors in St. Petersburg. We have a clean tech cluster. It's company organization uh, which um, building projects in clean tech area uh, as, um, <laughs> as uh, it's uh, like obvious. Um, but they like also governmental uh, entity and uh, they have some really serious uh, processing and uh, like serious agenda there is no such thing like community around it or something like uh, just uh, friendly help from uh, clean tech founders from one to other so uh, it's like more um, i think there are more bureaucracy there in this clusters but um, also they have uh, some um, some power uh, to support some projects with uh, the power of government. So some of these um, programs is really huge as clean tech cluster. And also we have um, since the lockdown and uh, COVID shows up, uh, we have some activities around med tech and health tech, but uh, it's like, uh, I think it would change at the moment, just because it's in the focus of public attention now, it's not uh, that big trend for us to do something, so many projects in med tech and health tech. So I think that it's like a time frame, this time frame would be end (laughs) at the moment. So um, also we have um, a big 
count of uh, big amount of uh, B2B uh, SaaS services in St. Petersburg, like uh, Semrush and Raik. It's like big companies who are startups at the moment, and now they just working globally. And uh, uh, they found they was founded in St. Petersburg some time ago. <laughs> so um, we have uh, like really strong business culture around B2B marketing and uh, as well SaaS services like service as a uh, software as a service so it's uh, like huge sector for St. Petersburg. Cool well thank you very much uh, for for that the detailed uh, roundup. Um, George do you have uh, any follow-on questions? Yes um, Katya is very interesting what you actually uh, mentioned if we were to start, if Corey and I came to, Mos to St. Petersburg and we said, okay, we'll start our own uh, startup, where would we go to raise capital? Would we go to uh, friends and family? Would we go to angel investors? What is your experience in this area? Startups in Russia firstly go to friends and family. It's obvious because uh, there is no such um, strong culture around business angels because uh, it's like uh, just some people <laughs> who uh, not, uh, um, it's sadly, but not transparent enough sometimes. So uh, you should know exactly who you're going to pitch <laughs> to know, uh, to, to raise money from business angel. And also we have several investment funds, but at the moment, as I saw, uh, we're not too active because uh, we have uh, in Russia just, I don't know, uh, several active funds. I can uh, share uh, the names if, if you would know, if you would like to, uh, I don't know, send it into show notes or something. Uh, but uh, it's not too much also. And um, we have, of course, governmental programs, as I said, and some of them support founders on the early stages. But also uh, we have some problems with early stage startups because um, uh, investments, investors in Russia uh, would like to, sh to see traction from the beginning. So they don't invest in ideas, they don't invest in first customers, they invest in some traction and a huge market behind this traction. So, uh, so what you're saying, is... sorry to interrupt you for a second, but what you're mm -hmm. saying is that, okay, um, friends, family give you the first capital together with your savings. So you take the business off the ground and uh, mm -hmm. after you've done your better testing, your alpha products in the market, after you have revenue, then you can go to some of these quote unquote institutional investors and raise some, some capital. Is that uh, the process? Yes, it's uh, mainly, it's, it is a process uh, because we have some programs which can invest in early stage startups, but it's like, um, I don't know, so um, small amount of money that startups can't do something really great and uh, uh, something really important on this amount of money. So we go going to bootstrap and uh, do something just um, on volunteering. <laughs> do you um, see, yeah. in, in this particular area, do you see the owners of Kaspersky, the owners of other successful um, companies, do they uh, act as a mentor? Do they act as investors? What, what are they doing? Yeah, some of them uh, acting like investors, some of them, of them uh, like, I, acting like mentors. And uh, uh, most of big companies like big corporations and tech corporations as well, like Yandex and Mail.ru and some other com big companies in Russia, uh, they are creating the corporate accelerators. At, uh, and uh, it's uh, like the second part of uh, potential uh, path for startups. But also uh, we have like, I don't know, huge wave of these accelerators last time, last uh, several, I don't know, a uh, couple of years. And uh, um, part of these companies just um, became disappointed by results. So some of uh, cor corporate, um, corporate uh, people who decided to involve some startups and uh, creating something together. It's like um, now it's changing course for them. It seems like that. But also we see uh, like uh, steel corporates 
still uh, started the own acceleration programs and uh, it's uh, i don't know it's the second part but for companies who focused on um, exact area like logistics or maybe um, uh, or maybe development or something like that just thank you thank you very mm -hmm. much yeah so you bring up an interesting point uh, we see sometimes that if there is not so much a focus on the accelerators and the incubators or startups maybe mm -hmm. sometimes it's led by the innovation centers within organizations so you're yep. saying that that is a big focus and if that is happening at the um, corporate level um, is is there some focus in in education like higher education you know uh, there is just several uh, universities who support startups and uh, creating acceleration programs for students and uh, we have I don't know, one or two universities who would like to start to experiment um, and take, uh, um, give a chance to, um, to do some, to build startup um, for students for a uh, graduation. So like uh, not the uh, science work and exact startup about this area, for example, medical or maybe engineering or something like that. So, um, but it's not too much also because I don't know if you see this, the list of uh, uh, companies and organizations in Russia and St. Petersburg uh, as well, um, who support startups, you will see like uh, the amount of these organizations, I don't know, about 15, or maybe 20 so it's not too much and uh, I think that we just in the beginning of this path and uh, I think that in several next years we would see something huge about it so I, um, we, we see like people um, who are building projects around I don't know tech star startup building for example mm -hmm. who involved in some volunteering community things they would like to build something great without governmental acceleration program and cooperative acceleration program and they build something about as, as yourself and uh, um, they trying to do something really important and useful for startups without um, being in depends of some opinion or some bureaucracy rules or something and uh, we have just i don't know several people in st petersburg who drive this uh, process and uh, um, as myself also and uh, we working together on this pro progress and uh, i think that in several years we will see something interesting because um, we like accumulating people power <laughs> around right, yeah. this process and uh, building something um, without any support of big companies and structures yeah and just uh, need it's a... really in in interesting trend i think this needs a momentum, right? Some density and momentum there. Um, now, one thing that we like to ask um, our, our directors, because we are going globally, is um, for people that are from outside your community and they mm -hmm. may be interested, they, may, they don't know enough about your community to even be interested. Are there some stereotypes um, mm -hmm. about your region, whether it is business in Russia or St. Petersburg, um, that uh, that's important to talk about, to get rid of the stereotype. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. It's uh, like a huge amount of stereotypes about Russia. Uh, also, it's um, it depends on political situation, of course. So uh, people just fear to start some business with Russians. And it's first point. And uh, second point, we don't have uh, proper... Um, proper legal um, things <laughs> like uh, uh, the law, a uh, kind of law in Russia, not uh, not British law. So it's like uh, the problems with um, legal entities of startups as well. And uh, we have this problem and uh, we see like um, the most of uh, European and US investors like seeing this region like uh, emerging developing region like okay <laughs> something in russia uh, ha something happens in russia but also we see like um, how companies started and if they have some support 
uh, at the beginning and uh, in the progress in, in the uh, in the in the stage of growth they become something really global and interesting also for foreign investors and uh, uh, this kind of stereotypes, I think that uh, some of people just uh, um, decided to not work with Russians because of some sanctions and uh, some, uh, I don't know, uh, mentality differences or something like that. It's also stereotypes about us. But um, when you started starting to work with global community and uh, being in, in just uh, when you're starting to be involved in some global project, you understand that it's not so big difference, I think. And uh, also, I don't know, maybe it's an uh, additional point about it. Uh, we don't have, um, I think, uh, proper cooperative culture in startups area. And uh, um, for example, in Estonia, when uh, where, um, where was Skype built it, and uh, the huge amount of people just create some proper culture around it. And it was the reason because Estonian market and startup uh, community really strong and they um, ready to work with global market. And uh, in Russia, we have just, I don't know, fear that, okay, my English not too, too good, or uh, I don't know how to enter some markets or how to test my idea there and some, the huge amount of some strange <laughs> things before right. and thoughts uh, about it. And also uh, we have this fear from founders in Russia and we have some fear from uh, foreign investors and partners who decided to not work with Russia just because. And uh, it's so essentially, a problem what, for us. Uh, Katya, what you're talking about mm -hmm. is the issue of corporate governance. Uh, ultimately, the idea of how a company is governed, how the environment in which uh, the company operates has to be funded and to be anchored on um, legal rights, clear legal rights, property rights, and of course, um, um, representation, right? So yeah. the issue of corporate governance is very important. Uh, and, and we see that many um, private equity investors, many venture capital investors in any startup environment, they pay a lot of attention to articles of incorporation, memorandum of understanding, shareholders, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah sure. uh, you brought up uh, the idea of uh, Estonia, which has a very robust program for e res E residency and bringing yeah. founders from all over the world and making mm -hmm. it easy for them to found companies and safe. And they advertise mm -hmm. that very specifically that it's, you know, it's safe and it's a good place to, to <laughs> launch a, a company, right? Even if you mm -hmm. don't live there. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we've been going around the world, we're finding other communities like in Santiago, Chile, that are doing similar things where it's very easy to mm -hmm. get a visa. And within 14 days, you can get into a um, the startup ecosystem and get some funding and some support and some connection to the region. So it's really fun to see that that's happening around the globe. Um, and it'd be nice to see more of it. Right. Um, and, uh, so speaking about the, the stereotypes and then the opportunities, uh, related thereof, I'm interested to hear just a little bit also about the, the mindset of the entrepreneur, like, uh, like, uh, the, is there uh, an entrepreneurial mindset among, among youth, uh, people that think that, okay, it is okay, it is time for me to create my own opportunity? Um, and related to that is the, the talent. Um, like, uh, is there a lot of outsourcing of talent? So or do you have a lot of tech people, since, they, since they're afraid to build something themselves because of the lack of support, but they are doing a lot of outsourcing, working for firms like say out of country or out of city? I think as we have like a huge amount of people, uh, young people who would like to do something as, uh, as themselves, just because uh, we have, I don't know, uh, next braver generation uh, who would like to build something great and uh, they uh, don't have much experience. It's obvious also, but also they have, I don't know, uh, like um, the really big drive about it and passion about it and we have at in each of my projects i have at least uh, a couple of young uh, people from age of 14 
and uh, older and uh, it's like uh, i don't know schoolmates uh, and uh, students who just trying to do something as ourselves and uh, it's like just exciting because they uh, going to events, they're trying to do something, hackathons, and so on, and so on, and uh, they really excited also about it, and uh, mm, we're trying to support them as well, because we see, like, in several years, they could become something really important for the scene, and we're trying to support them, of course. And uh, mm, about outsourcing, I don't know, um, at the moment when cities really doesn't matter <laughs> i think and uh, maybe it's uh, the really uh, long-term trend uh, so i think that maybe r some of uh, russian uh, developers and marketers and uh, i don't know product managers and other specialties uh, could be like really good work uh, power for some companies around the globe and uh, it wouldn't be matter where they sit <laughs> in mm -hmm. which city and uh, we also seeing trend uh, at the moment that some of our colleagues and uh, friends are just moving from really big cities to smaller cities where we're born and raised mm -hmm. and they just uh, enjoying it uh, this time uh, to be in the in some calm space and uh, uh, do something that they really appreciate uh, them and also uh, support their parents and friends uh, from uh, i don't know uh, childhood and so on so we see this trend at the moment i don't know uh, how long it will be um, um, last but uh, also i think that uh, if it is really a long-term trend. Uh, I think that some of Russian developers and our specialists would be really um, high valued on global market. So right. it's like... Oh. We, just, uh, we just spoke with uh, the chapter director in uh, Plovdiv, uh, Bulgaria, and, uh, and he was mentioning how, how big and robust of a uh, uh, outsourcing um, mm -hmm. That they have uh, just it, it rivals and matches uh, Ukraine, which most people just sort of like stereotypically would think of first. But mm -hmm. um, now, uh, one of the last questions I'd like to to ask you is, especially we just closed out what uh, Startup Grind calls like uh, Startup Grind Women's Month. Um, mm -hmm. When we know that the the COVID nineteen, regardless of where you are on the planet, even if you're in a country that is not affected by the disease so much, there are still lockdowns, uh, supply mm -hmm. chain effect. Um, things happening um, and there are different populations of people that are affected differently or more specifically women are affected at a greater number um, mm -hmm. um, like with that being said that means that on one hand there's more opportunity for there's more opportunity for equity if someone knows how to grab it um, but that's not always the case uh, because life mm -hmm. can be very difficult what what are there? Are there previous programs for women entrepreneurs um, that now find this a great opportunity to to work harder, or are there just? Uh, I guess maybe, you know, what is the landscape for female entrepreneurs even among this pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, female entrepreneurship in Russia not that huge problem for women uh, because women because um, I don't know we have like um, feminine public society I think here <laughs> from communism time <laughs> when um, all people was equal and so on so uh, if you're a woman uh, you just uh, do everything <laughs> so um, I think that we have some problems uh, with involving young uh, girls into entrepreneurship program because uh, we see uh, in all the community things we do there is a huge amount of uh, men and uh, not too much women in it and uh, also we see like i don't know about 20 percent uh, of uh, women as founders or maybe 15 or maybe 10 i, I don't know uh, exactly but i think that uh, it's pretty high numbers for uh, global uh, statistic and uh, also I don't see some huge problem with being female founder because if you founder 
you just founder. It's not uh, like a big difference who you are, female or, or not, or male. So it's um, not a really huge problem, but we have some troubles with uh, interacting with uh, young girls because uh, we see like uh, young boys, like 14, boy, uh, 14 years old and uh, uh, 16 years old, just excited about being involved and girls like, uh, okay, I, I will just uh, maybe join you later. <laughs> And uh, um, our goals as well uh, involve more women in our projects. And uh, we have uh, some of ideas, uh, for example, for Texter Startup Weekend, uh, one of uh, future offline, I, th I think, events, uh, to do something uh, exactly for women. So to uh, empower them and involve more of them and uh, showcase uh, really great success stories from female founders because it's like really a huge amount of them in Russia. It's not like a, um, leads, uh, so too small numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, great. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for all these insights. Uh, George, do you have any last uh, questions uh, before we like, nope. move to the I want to, to thank uh, Kate very much for her presentation. Um, thank you. I wish you great success in your work. I know it's not easy. Uh, the issue of corporate governance is a long-standing issue. And um, if you need uh, any uh, support from Corey or myself, please let us know. Uh, we're here always. Uh, we can give you ideas. We can give you uh, suggestions. Uh, and and uh, that's why the conversation has become much more meaningful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so one, la one last question. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, what can the larger Startup Grind community uh, do for you? Like you personally, Kate, or then or your, your chapter and ecosystem? What can, what can we do for you? I think that the best thing ever, and it uh, happens through lockdown, uh, to uh, lockdown, um, I don't know, it's lockdown, uh, let it happen more often. Uh, I think that I would like to be more connected with global network of, of founders and chapter directors and some ecosystem players. So it would be really great support for us in local community and for me personally to um, create, I don't know, maybe some mentorship space, maybe some like, I don't know, um, the network of people who would like to support founders on the other side of globe or something like that. So it would be really great because we have really big need in it because we started uh, four weeks ago we started a uh, traction program four weeks traction program and we finished it uh, this sunday and uh, the next one uh, we would like to do totally with foreign mentors and jury members so it's our goal to involve more global experts from around the globe in the local scene uh, projects and it will be the huge support from you and uh, our colleagues from startup grind to uh, do some in this direction so I would be just happy if it, it could be uh, happens in some kind well um, I, I personally would love to volunteer for that if, uh, if great first one you found one yeah Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm serious that, that sounds like a lot of fun um, great so then um, absolutely I will, so I, I will connect with you and uh, share all details. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, thank you again so much for the generosity of your time. It's been really yeah, remarkable you. listening and learning, learning a great deal about your ecosystem. Um, George and I both have a background in entertainment, just like you do. Um, mm -hmm. like, uh, and so it's nice to meet a kindred spirit who likes to also have a nice time. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe, yep. <laughs> maybe one day, um, after the COVID, we can find a, a dance floor. <laughs> yeah, I think that we should. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All, all um, of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Um, all right, uh, Kate, George, um, have a great rest of your day and thanks so much again. Thank you. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.